Hi friends, my name is Bijoy Ajayan. I belong to 2012 MBBS batch of Government Medical College Trivandrum. After my final year was over, I thought of doing something for my juniors and this video has come up as a consequence of that thought process. And in this video, I would like to discuss some concepts of neurology that would be useful for your practicals. And as we know, hemiplegia is the most common case often it is kept for the practicals. You can find many cases of hemiplegia and the board as well as for the practicals also it's kept. So I would like to concentrate the discussion around this topic. Now uh, as we reach final year the major obstacle that some of us would face is that we forget the basics what we have learned in the first year the neuroanatomy as well as the neurophysiology. Both of these are really volatile and once we reach the final year and the time when we start taking the cases and considering the clinics more seriously this lack of knowledge of neuroanatomy and neurophysiology it's very difficult to us at that point of time so whatever topics we are discussing we would discuss we would start it from the basics itself and in neurology as you know the most interesting thing in neurology is that once we take a proper history and do a proper clinical examination we would be able to localize the lesion that is to find out the anatomical site of lesion that is our main objective right while we are taking the case we have to know where is the lesion in our nervous system right so the process of localization or to find the anatomical site of the lesion is very important so i would be guiding you throughout this video to help do, through this process of localization right so let us start from the basics itself see our nervous system it is divided into two you know central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system so central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord while the peripheral nervous system it includes the cranial nerves there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves and the spinal nerves that is 31 pairs of spinal nerves are there along with the ganglia we, it constitutes the peripheral nervous system right so the peripheral nervous system can now be divided into two that is the somatic nervous system as well as the autonomous nervous system the somatic nervous system that is responsible for the voluntary control of the muscle while you know the autonomic nervous system constitutes the sympathetic as well as the parasympathetic nervous system right the fight or flight as well as the rest as well as digest right these are the functions of sympathetic as well as the parasympathetic system right so what would be the most common presentation that means a person who is having hemiplegia they will come to us saying sir I am having the weakness of one half of my body or weakness of one limb so this will be the major complaint of the patient right so it's very important that we know about the difference between plegia and paresis the terms plegia as well as paresis what does that mean now the paresis refers to partial paralysis while plegia refers to complete paralysis that means if a patient is having is said to have paralysis that means he is having a power of about grade 4 right but if he cannot move the limb it is if it is complete paralysis that means it is plegia right so there are several terms again monoplegia that indicates involvement of a single limb and hemiplegia that involves involvement of one half of the body then paraplegia where we have both the legs paralyzed right paralysis of the lower limb of the legs right of the lower limb that is paraplegia and then we have quadriplegia where we have all the four limbs paralyzed right so these are the terms and these are the meaning of these terms to understand this is very important now so the patient is saying he is having weakness right so we have to know if he is what is the power of the patient right so this is the medical research council scale for the muscle power if you yeah, you can grade the power as zero if you cannot find any contraction any muscle contraction is not visible then you can grade the power as zero and if you see a flicker of contraction but there is no movement then you can grade it as grade one and grade two that is joint movement with the effect of gravity eliminated that means you can ask the patient to move the limbs by by keeping itself in the bed itself not by elevating against the gravity so that is you are eliminating the effect of gravity and you can ask the patient to move the limb so that is joint movement with the effect of gravity eliminated then movement against gravity but not against the examiner's resistance if the patient is able to raise his limb against the gravity but not against resistance you will give the 
grade of 3 and the movement is against resistance but weaker than normal then it is grade 4 and grade 5 is the normal power right so now we understood that so uh, we are encountering a person with hemiplegia right so there is some deficit in his power right there is not some uh, deficit there is really a deficit in his power right so now we can now we know that there is something abnormal with the motor system right so motor system in fact we can divide it into two that is the pyramidal system as well as the extra pyramidal system so pyramidal system so this weakness can be due to a problem in the either in the pyramidal system or the weakness can be due to a problem in the extra pyramidal system right so first we will start with the basics of pyramidal system and then I will tell you the difference what is the difference between these two right so the motor pathway which we also call as the corticospinal tract or the pyramidal tract right that is the pyramidal system so where is the origin of this motor pathway see we have the motor cortex in at the cortical level we have the motor cortex that is in that is located in the precentral gyrus and also we have the premotor cortex and the supplementary motor area about 60 percentage of the fibers they do arise from this area of the motor cortex the supplementary motor area and the premotor cortex constitute 60 percent of the fibers while 40 percent of the fibers they do come from the sensory cortex right so this is the highest level right this is from where they are originating actually there are bed cells in the motor cortex about 30,000 bed cells are there in the motor cortex that give rise to the motor tract right that is the corticospinal tract so from the cortex as you can see in this figure from the cortex the entire fibers from the motor area as well as from the sensory area 40% fibers from the sensory area they are all coming in a radiating pattern and this radiating pattern we call it as the corona radiator right so once they come in the radiating pattern in the posterior limb of the internal capsule they will become they will converge they will converge through the posterior limb of the internal capsule right through a very small area and then they will slowly descend down and once through the midbrain through the pons and the medulla and once they reach the medulla another significant event happens here right about 80 percentage of the fibers they undergo decussation that means De the decussation they cross to the opposite side decussation is the more better term right so they about 80 percentage of the fibers they undergo decussation and they continue along the lateral column of the spinal cord as the lateral corticospinal tract right and about 20 percentage of the fibers they remain uncrossed and they will descend downwards to the spinal cord in the anterior column of the spinal cord as the anterior corticospinal tract right see we can see the descending fibers this is the lateral corticospinal tract that is going through the lateral part and this is the this is the anterior part of the spinal cord right this is the posterior part you can see the posterior horn the anterior horn the central canal is there and the dorsal column is also there so this is the descending fibers that is the lateral corticospinal tract and this is the anterior corticospinal tract right so this is how they are descending down the spinal cord right in this diagram again from the motor cortex they are coming they will converge through the posterior limb of the internal capsule coming downwards at the medulla they decussate as lateral corticospinal tract some of uh, uh, some of the fibers will continue downwards as anterior corticospinal tract right so the lateral corticospinal tract now they terminate on the lateral group of the motor neurons on the anterior horn of the spinal cord while the anterior corticospinal tract they terminate through an interneuron right they will terminate on the interneuron that is on the same side which in turn turn to the cross to the opposite side right you can see the crossing of the interneuron here so which in turn cross to the opposite side and terminate on the medial group of neurons so what is the function of lateral corticospinal tract and anterior corticospinal tract see lateral corticospinal tract is involved in controlling the skilled movements of the extremities that is for example writing right or holding an object with your fingers like that skilled movements of the extremities the lateral corticospinal tract does the job right 
while the anterior corticospinal tract it is responsible for the postural adjustment right so you can see this person standing the posture is maintained by the anterior corticospinal tract the motor innervation is being given to, by the anterior corticospinal tract right so now let me introduce another two terms which is often heard so what are those terms upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons what are upper motor neurons what are lower motor neurons so upper motor neurons are the neurons that originate in the cortex and terminate in the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord so this entire pathway constitutes the upper motor neurons and the lower motor neurons consist of the anterior horn cells to the neuromuscular junction or in simple words you can say that the lower motor neurons that are the neurons that terminate at the neuromuscular junction while the upper motor neurons they are the neurons that come from the higher levels and they terminate directly or indirectly on the lower motor neurons so that is upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron now for the upper motor neuron there is another definition that is that originate in the cortex and they terminate in the cranial nerve nuclei see this is applicable for the cranial nerve nuclei also that control our muscles various muscles are being controlled by the cranial nerve nuclei right so you can also these are also the upper motor neurons that is the neurons that start from the cortex and they end in the cranial nerve nuclei right these are the upper motor neurons then the cranial nerve nuclei along with the cranial nerve is the lower motor neuron that supplies the muscle that supplies the neuromuscular that ends in a neuromuscular junction so this is the lower motor neuron and this is the upper motor neuron right so this is applicable for both cranial nerves as well as the nerves uh, the peripheral nerves that is arising from the spinal cord right so once again the upper motor neurons the neurons that originate in the cortex and terminate in the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord or the cranial nerve nuclei are called as the upper motor neuron and lower motor neurons are the anterior horn cells and the peripheral nerve that supplies the neuromuscular junction also the cranial nerves nuclei the cranial nerve nuclei and the cranial nerves which supply the muscles are again the lower motor neurons so this concept is very important once you know uh, because we have to know what would happen if there is a lesion there right so this concept is very important now let us see what are the features of an upper motor neuron lesion right so before that i think we can learn about the structure of our muscle as well as the stretch reflex because that is the basics for learning why this features come why the, the, these features are present in upper motor neuron lesion to know that more clearly we will first see in brief about the muscle fibers as well as the innervation right so see this is our muscle our muscle consists of two types of fibers the extrafusal fibers and the intrafusal fibers the extrafusal fibers they make up the bulk of the muscle while the intrafusal fibers they are smaller than the extrafusal fibers but they get encapsulated in sheath to form the muscle spindles right what are these muscle spindles they are nothing but they are the sensory fibers right they are the sensory receptors that detect the change in length of the muscle if there is any change in the length of the muscle these muscle spindles are the sensory receptors that detect the change right so the extrafusal fibers are innervated that forms the bulk of the muscle are innervated by alpha motor neurons while the intrafusal fibers are innervated by the gamma motor neurons right now this intrafusal fibers again can be divided into two that is the nuclear back fibers right and the nuclear chain fibers the nuclear back fibers are innervated by the group 1a afferents right that is the sensory neuron sensory supply goes through the group 1a afferents and the group 2 afferents carry information from the nuclear chain fibers and the motor innervation comes to it in the form of gamma motor fibers right so gamma motor fibers what is the function of gamma motor neuron the gamma motor neuron it adjusts the sensitivity of the muscle spindle so that the muscle spindle will respond adequately during the muscle contraction once the muscle is contracting the muscle spindle should respond appropriately so 
the function of the gamma motor neuron is that it adjusts the sensitivity of the muscle spindle right so now let us see the stretch reflex what is stretch reflex stretch reflex you can define it as it is a stereotyped contraction of a muscle in response to a stretch of the muscle or you can say that whenever a muscle is stretched there will be contraction of the muscle right why do we need to learn about this stretch reflex because this is the primary mechanism that regulates the tone of the muscle right we say hypertonia hypotonia so to understand that concept you need to know about the stretch reflex right and for that the easiest uh, way is to demonstrate the deep tendon reflex right so which we do for example the knee jerk in this case we are we are taking the example of a knee jerk so your pat uh, this is the quadriceps muscle this is the patella and this is the patella tendon or the quadriceps tendon so you are striking while doing the knee jerk you are striking the patella tendon with your knee hammer right now what happens once you are striking with the knee hammer there is a sudden stretch on the quadriceps muscle right because the tendon is stretched the muscle is also stretched there's a sudden stretch and this stretch is recognized by the muscle spindles which are present the intrafusal fibers i have told you they are the sensory receptors this stretch is recognized by the muscle spindle the muscle spindles get activated by the stretch and the impulses are carried through 1a fibers and through the dorsal rod ganglion they reach the spinal cord now from the spinal cord what happens actually now from the spinal cord the neurons the the alpha motor neurons that are supplying the same muscle that is the quadriceps muscle itself are stimulated thereby causing what contraction of the quadriceps muscle the alpha motor neurons will cause the contraction of the quadriceps muscle and you can see that the knee will extend slightly right so that is the knee jerk which you are seeing and at the same time through an inhibitory interneuron right it will inhibit the antagonist muscle in this case the hamstrings the hamstrings will be inhibited and the quadriceps muscle is activated so this is how you are getting this is how uh, you are getting the knee jerk right so now what exactly happens in upper motor neuron lesion see the upper motor neurons are generally inhibitory to the lower motor neurons so in upper motor neuron lesion once there is a lesion in the upper motor neuron pathway this will in this will this influence this inhibitory influence is lost right it has got an inhibitory influence the inhibitory influence is lost and as a result what happens the motor neuron discharge starts to increase the motor neuron discharge especially the gamma motor neuron discharge right the gamma motor neuron discharge starts to increase so once this increases what i have told you that this will increase the sensitivity this is adjusting the sensitivity of the muscle spindle right so this is going to increase the sensitivity of the muscle spindle and thereby it is going to exaggerate the reflex right so that is the reason why you get an exaggerated deep tendon reflex in case of an upper motor neuron lesion right this is the physiological basis why do you get an exaggerated deep tendon reflex because the inhibitory effect is lost there is increased motor neuron discharge making the muscle spindle more much sensitive and resulting in exaggerated deep tendon reflex and of course the hypertonia is also due to this increased motor neuron discharges right so now another mechanism let us learn is the inverse stretch reflex so this is the muscle stretch reflex and this is the inverse stretch reflex so muscle stretch reflex causes the stretched muscle to contract now what happens if the stretch is very high or if there is a very high load on your muscle then the inverse muscle stretch reflex starts to happen right that will cause the activated muscle to relax so that is causing for example i tell you you are having a 5 kg weight in your hand right and you are adding another 5 kg weight now your muscle is so much stressed right so you will feel still you can hold it but what happens once you are adding one more 10 kg weight over to it an object of another 10 kg is added to this 10 kg you will suddenly drop it down why because if you don't drop it down the muscle is at risk of tear right so this drop is actually it's not voluntary it's involuntary happening right so how does this happen at extremes of stretch muscle stretch there are golgi tendon organs right these golgi tendon organs get activated and 
once these get activated through the 1b fibers this will uh, this impulses will go to the spinal cord and through inhibitory interneuron the alpha motor neurons which is supplying the same muscle is inhibited right so once this is inhibited the muscle will not con not contract anymore it will relax right so that is the inverse muscle stretch reflex now what is the physiological significance of inverse stretch reflex the physiological significance is that it prevents the rupture of the muscle when the muscle is stretched to a greater extent right and so that is the physiological significance now what is the clinical significance of this one so the the clinical significance is that see in you have seen so a patient has come to you with weakness you know that it is an upper motor neuron lesion so you are expecting hypertonic hypertonia right so the muscles you know the muscles are hypertonic once the muscles are hypertonic that means there is increased sensitivity of the muscle spindles right so in the in your triceps muscle the muscle uh, the sensitivity of the sensitivity of the muscle spindle is really high and once you are trying to flex the elbow right once you are trying to flex the elbow of the patient what happens this increased sensitivity of the muscle spindle in the triceps muscle it will cause resistance to the flexion of the arm right you cannot flex because this is overactive right so you will find it difficult to flex the arm now what will you do you will give start applying more force right and you keep on applying the force such that the tension in the triceps reaches a point that it activates the golgi tendon organ right so at that point of time the golgi tendon organ is activated causing the triceps muscle to relax and this will cause the muscle to flex right the elbow to flex so this is the usual setting that you see in a, a patient with hypertonia right so increased resistance initially at a point of time it will give away and immediately the arm will flex or the limb will flex so there is a sudden release after reaching a maximum there is a sudden release and this phenomenon is called as the clasp knife phenomenon or the clasp knife spasticity so now you know it is because of the reflex inverse stretch reflex because the golgi tendon organs of the triceps muscle being stimulated you are having that increased resistance uh, you are you are initially you will be having the increased resistance and once the golgi tendon organs are getting stimulated it will give off the resistance you are able to flex the elbow right so this is called that clasp knife spasticity from where did this word came clasp knife see this is the clasp knife right you have seen this in the initial part to open this knife you will have to apply more force right and once a point is reached it will open by itself right so from this name the clasp knife phenomenon the same thing has come into existence okay now another important another important terms to be known here is what is spasticity what is rigidity right these two terms are really important to know so what is spasticity spasticity is nothing but the velocity dependent increase in the tone so when you are checking the spasticity you have to increase the velocity of flexing the limb right so once you increase the velocity you can be able to identify the spasticity so that is velocity dependent increase in the tone is called spasticity and what is rigidity rigidity is nothing but it is the length dependent increase in the tone right so spasticity it predominantly affects the anti gravity muscles the anti gravity muscles namely the upper limb flexors and the lower limb extensors while in rigidity both the groups of muscles whether it is the agonist as well as the antagonist both are equally affected in case of rigidity now spasticity is seen in case of a pyramidal lesion which we have talked till now right a pyramidal lesion there is spasticity and rigidity is seen in case of an extra pyramidal lesion right so we have discussed about the pyramidal tract that which is the dominant motor pathway right it is a dominant motor pathway that plans that initiate as well as executing the movements it is the function of the pyramidal system now clinically you can classify the motor system into pyramidal as well as extra pyramidal system whenever we are saying about the extra pyramidal system we mean to say about the we refer to the diseases of the basal ganglia as well as the cerebellum right and what is the function of this extra pyramidal pathway its function is to coordinate or fine tune the movements so this is the major function of the 
extra pyramidal system to fine tune the movements or to coordinate the movements right so in case of an extra pyramidal lesion you have to ex you have to think you will think of rigidity right rigidity is present in case of extra pyramidal lesion right so how will you distinguish between a pyramidal and an extra pyramidal lesion see in case of a pyramidal system lesion we can see that the power loss or the loss of power is much higher compared to the disorder of the tone for example in the most common example we are talking about is hemiplegia right in hemiplegia you can see the power is lost but the tone is not that much affected in case of an extra pyramidal lesion right so in pyramidal lesion the loss of power is greater when compared to the disorder of the tone and in extra pyramidal lesion the disorder of the tone is more than the loss of power you can see that in persons with parkinsonism right they have the power to walk at least the power will be almost around 4 right and they will be having a power of 4 but what is their main problem their main problem is rigidity right so the disorder of the tone is more than the loss of power this is how you clinically differentiate between an extra pyramidal lesion as well as a pyramidal lesion right so in spasticity so coming back the differences between spasticity and rigidity in spasticity you have the clasp knife phenomenon which i have explained it now now in rigidity we can classify it into two types that is one is the lead pipe rigidity as well as second is the cork wheel rigidity so the lead pipe rigidity there is a uniform resistance to the passive movement that means throughout the range of motion you will having it you'll be having a uniform resistance while in case of cog wheel rigidity there will be intermittent release will be there right sometimes that means it is just like this this is a cog wheel right so when this is rotating the cog wheel will rotate just like this right intermittently there will be jerks so when you are doing the when you are checking the tone of the patient who is having an extra pyramidal lesion right who is having a cog wheel rigidity it will just go like this right because so what is the reason for this because the tremors are getting superimposed on the rigidity so when you get tremors superimposed on the rigidity you will get a cog wheel type of rigidity right there is intermittent release in the increased resistance fine now another important difference between the spasticity as well as rigidity is that in case of spasticity being it an upper motor neuron lesion usually the plantar you will get it extensor and in case of rigidity the plantar is going to be a flexor right so these are the differences now this is a common question that is asked by the examiners that is you have to know the root value of the deep tendon reflexes which we do right the biceps jerk is having a root value of c5 c6 and it is supplied by the musculocutaneous nerve the supinator jerk that is again having the same root value of bicep jerk but it is supplied by the radial nerve then the tricep jerk it is c6 c7 supplied by the radial nerve the knee jerk l2 l3 l4 supplied by the femoral nerve and ankle jerk it is s1 s2 and it is supplied by the tibial nerve so whenever you are doing the reflexes please make sure that you are tapping it in the direction perpendicular to the tendon whether you do the bicep jerk or the triceps any any deep tendon reflex you are doing tap the knee hammer perpendicular to the direction of the tendon see here this is the direction you are tapping it perpendicularly this is the triceps jerk and this is the supinator jerk right now these are the lower limb deep tendon reflexes the knee jerk as well as the ankle jerk you will keep the limb over the the limb to be tested and you have to slightly dorsiflex only slightly dorsiflex don't do extreme dorsiflexion because you will not you, you may not get the reflex so only do slight dorsiflexion right with slight dorsiflexion with your hand and tap it perpendicular to the tendon right now what if the reflexes are absent what will you do at this point of time there is something useful that is called as the gendrasix manual what is gendrasix manual you can ask the patient to either to clench the teeth you can ask the patient to clench the teeth before doing the upper limb reflexes and for the lower limb reflexes you can ask to tighten the hand like this right and pull it apart while you are doing the reflex tighten the hand 
ask the patient to tighten the hand do the reflex and tap the tendon and then ask him to relax right so that is the gentraxic manual that will that is a reinforcement mechanism that will if, if the reflexes are poor if you, if you cannot or if you find the reflexes to be absent try it doing with the gentraxic manual right so we have talked about hypertonia the exaggerated deep tendon reflexes right now we will come to the superficial reflexes this there is a the feature of in um in the in uml lesion you will get loss of superficial reflexes mainly the abdominal reflex and the grimastric reflexes right now why these reflexes are lost in hemiplegia why this superficial reflex the abdominal reflex as well as the grimastic reflex are lost in hemiplegia the reason is that these reflexes they have a cortical pathway in addition to the spinal reflex arc so you know the reflex arc that goes through the spinal cord in addition to that they also have a cortical pathway so the afferent fibers they travel up in the spinal cord and up to the parietal cortex and the efferent fibers they will descend to the anterior horn cells in the spinal cord now these efferent fibers descend in close association with the pyramidal tract right so whenever there is a lesion in the pyramidal tract the efferent pathway is disrupted so resulting in the loss of superficial reflexes right so this is how you test for the abdominal reflex you have to stroke it lightly in the direction of these arrows shown right and also if you can do you can do the cremastic reflex also fine now another feature of an upper motor neuron lesion is extensive plantar response I, we will discuss about it in a minute and the wasting in case of an upper motor ne neuron lesion is minimal why because there is only disuse atrophy in case of an upper motor neuron lesion right this is in contrast to a lower motor neuron lesion we will see later so in case of upper motor neuron lesion the wasting is only minimal this is due to disuse atrophy the patient is not using the hands or is, is not using the muscle so as a result of disuse there will be slight atrophy and the wasting is minimal in case of an upper motor neuron lesion right then clonus may be present in case of an upper motor neuron lesion sometimes the examiners often ask to elicit the clonus how will you elicit the clonus right so you have to support the knee you can see so first you have to support the knee and you have to quickly dorsiflex the ankle right support the knee with your left hand and with your right hand you can quickly dorsiflex the knee with slightly everting the foot and you have to maintain the pressure on the sole so that you can see the clonic movements right see supporting this one below the knee and you have to apply pressure and maintain the pressure see you can see the clonus right so this is the method of eliciting the clonus right so let us see uh, now another common question which the examiners ask us what are the other causes of hypertonia or hyperreflexia of course you know the upper motor neuron lesion the clasp knife spasticity is one of the cause and extra pyramidal lesions are the other cause and there are some other causes also for hypertonia or hyperreflexia that include anxiety hyperthyroidism that is only hyperreflexia is that the tone is normal in case of hyperthyroidism and, and excuse me and in case of tetanus as well as strychnine poisoning and hypocalcemia so all these conditions you would be getting hypertonia or hyperreflexia right now we come to a very important topic that is the plantar reflex often in the examination the practicals many questions are asked based on this topic that is the plantar reflex the examiner can ask to elicit the plantar reflex as well as he will ask what are the components of a normal of a flexor plantar response response of an extensor plantar response right so please listen this carefully so the plantar reflex remember the plantar reflex is a superficial reflex and the segmental innervation of the plantar reflex is s1 s2 so what is the position to do a plantar reflex you can do it in the knee extended position that is the preferred position in the knee extended position you can do it so first of all you have to fix the leg on the couch okay on the bed you have to fix the leg with your left hand above the ankle then you have to check for the mobility of the big toe right so because big toe is the 
is a very important component of this reflex. So you have to check if it is mobile or not. So you have to check if the big toe is mobile. And then you have to ask the patient to keep the foot relaxed. Don't keep the foot to be stiff. Okay. You can ask the patient to keep relaxed. Have a relaxed. Whatever reflexes you do, ask the patient to keep the limb relaxed. Right. And after that, you have to apply a graded noxious stimulus. Right. A noxious stimulus is applied with the help of a blunt end of a key. A key is better in getting, you'll get the reflex more better with a key, right? So you can use the key or the end of the percussion hammer, right? With the end of your knee hammer, the, you have the pointed end, right? With that pointed end, you can slightly stroke on the lateral aspect of the sole, right? On the lateral aspect of the sole from the heel towards the little toe and then medially across the metatarsis up to the mid tarsus. That is, you should not cross the ball of the big toe, right? Why you should not cross? If you cross the ball of the big toe, you might get an extensor plantar response even in normal persons, right? Even in normal persons, you might get an extensor plantar response if you cross the ball of the big toe. So from here up till here, right? Never cross the ball of the big toe. So let us see how it is done. See, you are fi he's flexing, uh, fixing the leg, ankle, leg above the ankle and stroking it on the lateral aspect of the sole right up to the ball of the big toe see you can see the reflex so that is how you are eliciting a plantar reflex right now what is the normal plantar response it is flexor plantar response right why do you get a flexor why the normal plantar response is flexor that is that also has a reason in fact you know for locomotion the fl we, have, we need a stronger flexion for locomotion when compared to extension. So the flexion movement of the foot as well as the toes are more powerful when compared to the extension. So because why? What is the reason? We need stronger flexion for locomotion and hence the normal plantar response is flexor. Right? So this is a common question asked. What are the components of a normal plantar response or a flexor plantar response? See? depends upon the stimulus that is given if you are giving a very mild stimulus the, you can see the contraction of the tensor fascia lata right the green color thing right actually this is just coded green color right so the tensor fascia lata you can see the contraction of the tensor fascia lata the adductors of the thigh as well as the sartorius now you are increasing the stimulus intensity of the stimulus you will get you are giving this is with a mild stimulus with a moderate stimulus you will get flexion of the all the outer four toes right there will be flexion then even more you are increasing the stimulus you will get the flexion of the great toe there will be dorsiflexion of the foot and inversion of the foot right the foot will get inverted there will be dorsiflexion as well as there is flexion of the great toe so we are mainly looking for the flexion of the great toe right so flexion of the great toe dorsiflexion of the foot and inversion will be there and even more if you are increasing the stimulus there will be withdrawal the patient may withdraw the limb right so all these are the components of a normal or a flexor plantar response remember it as it's do not forget now the extensor plantar response now what happens in case of an upper motor neuron lesion the response which you get in the plant while you do the plantar reflex in a patient with an upper motor neuron lesion is the extensor plantar response or you also call it as the positive Babinski's sign right what are the components of an extensor plantar response there will be extension of the big toe there will be extension as well as abduction just opposite to what we have heard in flexor response right in flexor response there will be flexion of the big toe and uh, adduction as well as flexion of the other toes in case of extensor plantar response there is extension of the big toe and extension and abduction fanning out of the other toes and there will be dorsiflexion of the ankle and flexion withdrawal of the knee and hip so these are the components of an extensor plantar response right now this is another common question asked what are the causes of an extensor plantar response right physiologically in infants as well as in deep sleep you would be able to get an extensor plantar response right why in infants because in infants the corticospinal tract is not that developed so initially in infants 
when you are doing the reflex you, reflex, you will get an extensive plantar response. But as soon as the corticospinal tract undergoes myelination and as it develops, this reflex is converted to the flexor response. And in case of an upper motor neuron, what happens? The corticospinal tract, there is a lesion. Again, you are getting an extensive plantar response. Right. So, upper motor neuron lesion above the L5 spinal segment. Then in cases of coma, transiently after the seizure, after the period of, after a seizure episode, you can get an extensive plantar response. Then in case of raised intracranial tension, also it is possible. Then metabolic encephalopathy. In case of hypoglycemia, as well as alcohol intoxication, right? These are all the causes where you can get, you might get an extensive plantar response. Now, sometimes you do the reflex, you will not get any response. So, what are the conditions where you don't get any response? One thing is that loss of sensation of the soul, especially in patients, in chronic diabetic patients where they, uh, they, where they have diabetic neuropathy, right? There will be loss of sensations and you might not get any response, right? And in case of thick sole or in any lesion of the reflex arc, in the reflex arc, if there is any lesion of the reflex arc, you will not get any response, right? Then there is another term that is called as the inversion of plantar response. What is it? You know, when the flexors of the toe are paralyzed, the unopposed action of the extensors can cause extension. So this is called as inversion of plantar response. That means the flexion is not happening because the flexors are paralyzed. The short flexors of the toe are paralyzed. Right, so that is inversion of plantar response. Fine. So, yes. Now, what are the other methods to elicit the plantar response, extensive plantar response? There are some other methods, but the most specific method is what we have discussed now. But uh, there are some other methods which by which you can elicit the plantar response, especially in case of widespread upper motor neuron lesions. When the lesion is very wide, you know, the reflexogenic zone, the zone where you can get the area in which you can get the reflex is also enhanced, right? So it will travel upward. The earlier was earlier on the lateral aspect of the soul, right? Now it will keep on traveling upwards, right? So that is reflexogenic zone is enhanced. So there are several methods. One method is the Oppenheim's reflex. So how will you do the open hems reflex? You have to do you have to do a firm stroke with the index finger as well as the thumb on the anterior margin of the tibia from the knee to the ankle, right? This is how th th this and this time you will get the extensor plantar response. You call it as the open hems sign. Another important sign is the Sheffer's sign. That is you are applying deep pressure on the Achilles tendon. That is Sheffer's sign. Then Chadock sign. Chadock sign is nothing but a light stroke below the external malleolus that will cause again you will get the extensive plantar response that is the Chadock sign and there is another sign that is called as the Gordon sign G-O-R-D-O-N Gordon sign that sign is nothing but you have to squeeze the a hard squeeze on the calf muscles will result in the extensive plantar response and there is another sign that is called as the Bing sign that is flexion of the big toe will occur on pricking the dorsum of the foot with a pin right so all these are the different signs other other signs to elicit the plantar response now what if the toes are absent or if there is withdrawal of the limb then in this in such cases when the, when the patient doesn't have a toe or if there is withdrawal of the limb the patient withdraws the limb right then you can look for the contractions of hamstrings as well as the tensor fascia latter right so if you find the hamstrings if the contraction of the hamstrings are more than that of the tensor fascia latter that means it is an extensor plantar response while if the tensor fascia latter contracts more than the hamstrings it is a flexor plantar response now the plantar response we are saying in case of lower limb right now there are some upper limb equivalents for the plantar reflex right there are some upper limb signs of hyper reflexia one of the sign is the Hoffman sign what is the Hoffman sign you have to flex the tip of the middle finger and you have to flick it down suddenly this will cause flexion and adduction of the thumb just look at this video see you are holding the middle finger you are suddenly flicking it down watching for the flexion and abduction 
and flexion and adduction of the thumb right so this is Hoffman's sign right you are flicking it flick, flicking the middle finger down suddenly look for the flexion and adduction of the thumb so that is Hoffman's reflex or Hoffman's sign now another sign is the Wartenberg sign how will you do the Wartenberg sign you have to interlock the flexed fingers you have to see you have to interlock the flexed fingers of the patient with your flexed fingers and try to pull it apart so normally the thumb rem will remain uh, abducted as well as extended but in case of an upper motor neuron lesion or an epidermal lesion the thumb will flex and it will adduct right see the thumb is adducting this thumb is flexing and adducting otherwise in a normal case the thumb would be abducted as well as extended right so this is the Wartenberg sign this sign is also called as Wartenberg sign so now we have covered the upper motor neuron lesion right now we will see the lower motor neuron lesion right I hope you remember what is the lower motor neuron from the anterior horn cells to the that is the peripheral nerve right from and including the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord up to the neuromuscular junction here any lesion is there is a lower motor neuron lesion or the cranial nerve nuclei and the cranial nerve lesion that is also a lower motor neuron lesion any neuron that supplies the neuromuscular junction right that can be called as a lower motor neuron so what are the features just opposite to that of upper motor neuron there will be hypotonia hypertonia is a feature of upper motor neuron lesion in case of a lower motor neuron lesion there will be hypotonia or that is flaccid paralysis there it is spastic it is hypertonia there is increased motor neuron discharge but here the nerve is denervated right nerve is cut so there will be hypotonia and flaccid paralysis will be there then the weakness will be very severe when compared to an upper motor neuron lesion the weakness is more severe and you can find that individual muscles will be paralyzed rather than overall weakness individual muscles is, are going to be paralyzed in case of lower motor neuron lesion because it is directly supplying the muscle those muscles will be affected then the deep tendon reflexes again there will be a reflexia or hyporeflexia the reflexes can be absent or it can be diminished right the superficial reflexes are again lost as in case of an upper motor neuron lesion and the most the, the very important thing is that the wasting will be marked in case of an a lower motor neuron lesion and why is it so because in case of a lower motor neuron lesion you have both the things that is not only disuse atrophy you the main thing is that you are having a denervation atrophy see normally when the nerve is intact the nerve secretes some growth factors right some growth factors are secreted so that the bulk of the muscle is maintained right so once there is denervation due to that denervation this nerve growth factors are, the release of this nerve growth factors is abolished and as a result of this de uh, denervation there will be atrophy and this atrophy is called as denervation atrophy as well as there will be disuse atrophy will also be there so both of these combined together will result will make the waste more marked now another important sign of lower motor neuron lesion is fasciculation fasciculation is early sign the late sign is fibrillation so what is fasciculation what is fibrillation fasciculation are nothing but twitches or contraction twitches or contraction of group of muscle fibers the important term is that it is the contraction of a group of muscle fibers and this produces a visible twitch on the skin right you can see here see you can see the visible twitches on the skin because a group of muscle fibers are contracting right so that is called fasciculation now what is fibrillation fibrillation is first of all it is invisible right the, the fibrillation is invisible it is the rapid twitching of individual muscle fibers the muscle fi the individual muscle fibers while in fasciculation the group of muscle fibers are affected while in fibrillation individual muscle fibers are affected and this can be detected on this is not visible and this is detected on electromyography right so that is the difference between fasciculation and fibrillation both are features of a lower motor neuron lesion right now this is as we have said the causes of hypertonia what are the high causes of hypotonia or hyporeflexia the lower motor neuron lesion of course and upper motor neuron in the neuronal shock stage see this is a very interesting thing 
in the ward a patient is coming with an acute stroke now you are examining the patient you might see you will not see the hypertonia you will find the limbus flaccid the limb is hypertonic now what is the reason for this the reason is nothing but the patient the stage of hemiplegia in the patient is the neuronal shock stage in the neuronal shock stage you will not get any reflex all the reflex you will get air reflex here you will get hypotonia so don't confuse it that it would be an lmn lesion it is a umn lesion patient coming in the neuronal shock stage right then cerebellar lesions chorea hypothyroidism hypokalemic or hyperkalemic periodic paralysis sleep sedatives and muscle relaxant drugs can also cause hypotonia or hyporeflexia right so see this is the right right side this is the left side the upper motor neuron coming down from the cortex right from the precentral gyrus it is coming down in the brain stem it will undergo decussation right medullary pyramids it will undergo decussation pyramidal decussation this is called pyramidal decussation so in the pyramids they will decussate to the opposite side and travel through the spinal cord and synapse in the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord and this is the lower motor neuron the anterior horn cell and the peripheral nerve that is the lower motor neuron so if there is a lesion at point a or point b what will be the features since this is crossing to the opposite side contralaterally there will be spastic paresis right that is spasticity will be there hypertonia upper motor neuron lesion on the opposite side always remember this is crossing so this is happening on the opposite side of the body if it is the right upper motor neuron lesion you are getting it on the left side of the body right if here now what if the upper motor neuron is having a lesion in the spinal cord a lesion in the spinal cord will cause spastic weakness again the weakness is spastic because it is upper motor neuron right but that will be on the same side when the spinal cord is involved the decussation has happened that will be on the same side ipsilateral as well as below the lesion there will be spastic weakness will be there then what about d and e that is the lower motor neuron involvement there will be flaccid paralysis i have told you there will be hypotonia there will be flaccid paralysis ipsilateral and at the level of lesion right that is also important at the level of lesion there will be a flaccid paralysis in case of lower motor neuron lesion so i hope you have understood what are the differences what are the features of upper motor neuron lesion what are the features of lower motor neuron lesion and what are the differences between these two so that is about the motor system now in our further discussion often we need to discuss about the sensory pathway so i am telling the sensory pathway now itself we will discuss about the sensory pathway now itself why because in our future discussion we need that right so the sensory pathway we can divide it into three that is the dorsal column pathway the anterior lateral system and the spino cerebellar pathway other pathways like spino cerebellar pathway so first we will discuss about the dorsal column pathway so first of all what are the sensations so what is what does the sensory pathway do nothing it carries the sensation from the periphery to the cortex to the brain right so carrying the sensations is the function of sens sensory system so dorsal column pathway let us see what are the sensation first let us see what are the sensations that are being carried by the dorsal column pathway fine touch how will you check the fine touch you can check with the help of a cotton wool random touch using a cotton wool on both the sides right compare it that is how you are uh, you are testing the fine touch fine touch is carried through dorsal column pathway then vibration sense how will you check the vibration sense you have to use a tuning fork of 128 hertz because better vibration right and you have to place the tuning fork over the bony prominences like the dorsum of the distal phalanx of the big toe the medial and the lateral malleoli and the tibial tuberosity or the acromion process the olecranon process the styloid process all these are bony prominences right so you can place it over there and check for this one right so that is vibration sense you are checking for the vibration sense of the patient that is also being carried by the dorsal column pathway now the proprioception that is the position for the proprioception you have two things position sense as well as joint sense how will you check the position sense see you can place the arm in a particular position place the arm of the patient in a particular position and keep it in the resting position right then ask the patient to close the eyes and 
as uh, and ask him to elevate the limb to the demonstrated position and also elevate the opposite limb to the same position right so that is how you look for the position sense then the joint joint sense or the sense of passive movement how will you check for the joint sense first of all fix the proximal joint it is very important that you fix the hold the uh, fix the proximal joint and uh, you have to hold the sides of the distal phalanx right you have to hold it like this not like this because once you hold it like this the pressure is being applied so to find the joint position sense you will have to hold it like this right so that is the hold the sides of the distal phalanx and you have to move it up and down and first you have to do it with eyes open show him show the patient how you are doing and what uh, you have to move it up and ask the patient how it how he feels whether it is up or down right and six consecutive correct answers are required to report the sense of passive movement or the joint position sense as normal so that is important now another sensation that is being carried is the two point discrimination so the two point discrimination before that tactile localization is there right tactile what is tactile localization with the eyes closed you can touch the patient's body with your finger and ask the patient to localize that same point using his own finger right that is you are localizing you are just touching the uh, body of the patient and after that you have to ask the patient uh, you have to ask the patient to locate that side with the own finger of the patient right that is tactile localization then you have two point discrimination so two point discrimination is nothing but the ability to detect that a stimulus a stimulus consists of two different points right two blunt points that is simultaneously when it is applied simultaneously right so there is a specific distance where you can differentiate the two points otherwise if the distance is so close you might you will not be able to differentiate it as two separate points you will think it as just one point right so you have to you can use a compass divider or any blunt object right you can use the paper clip also the ends of the paper clip you can open the up the paper clip and using the ends you can check it so you can find the minimum distance that is to perceive it as two stimuli right so what is the minimum distance normally it is 3 mm on the lips then 3 to 5 mm on the fingertips it's 2 to 3 cm on the dorsum of the hand and 3 to 4 cm on the dorsum of the foot then on the interscapular area at the back it is 4 to 5 cm right so if if you are placing it at a distance of 2 cm on the interscapular area the person will say it as one right so you have to check it by placing one point and two points if he is able to discriminate two point discrimination right so another important sensation that is carried by the dorsal column pathway is the stereognosis so what is stereognosis the it is the ability to identify known objects that is the object should be known to the patient just simple objects you can use like pen or a key etc or a coin all these things can be used this are, are familiar objects right so familiar objects it is the ability to identify the familiar object with the feel of its size and shape with the eyes closed right you have to ask the patient to close the eyes and place a coin or a pen on the patient's hand and by the feel of that object he should be able to know what is the object right so that is stereognosis now what is the, so so that is stereognosis that is also carried by the dorsal column pathway and another important thing is the graphesthesia what is graphesthesia it is the ability to recognize the letters or the numbers if let it be the letters a b c d e or like the letters or the numbers 1 2 3 4 right that is written on the skin with a blunt point right with a blunt point you are writing on the skin if you are able to recognize that that is called as graphesthesia so the graph sensation of graphesthesia is also being carried by the dorsal column pathway see all these dorsal column pathway you know the dorsal column pathway is highly myelinated so as to provide very fast transmission of impulse and evolutionarily if you are checking this is the most developed pathway actually this is most i mean in human beings when compared to the lower animals in human beings it is very well developed the dorsal column pathway so also shows the evolution right so because more complex sensations are being carried by the dorsal column pathway rather than the pain and temperature right so that is the importance of dorsal column pathway so now we know what are the sensations that are being carried just one more time the fine touch 
the vibration sense the proprioception that is the position sense as well as the joint position sense that is the sense of passive movement the two point discrimination the tactile localization the stereognosis as well as graphesthesia all these are carried by the dorsal column pathway now let us see how these are carried through the dorsal column pathway right so you have the first order neurons here right the first order neurons from the receptors the first order neurons come and they have their cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion and from there they reach the spinal cord and they ascend upwards in the dorsal column of the spinal cord right they are ascending upwards in the dorsal column of the spinal cord now how they are ascending up see this is the dorsal column of the spinal cord now medially you have the fasciculus gracilis fasciculus means nothing but the bundle of the nerve fibers right so if you have the bundle of nerve fibers that is termed as fasciculus gracilis the fasciculus gracilis consists of the nerve fibers that are coming from the lower extremity right from the lower extremity you have the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus that is from the upper extremity so here you can see from the upper extremity the fasciculus cuneatus come from the lower extremity you have the fasciculus gracilis right so so this will ascend up in the same side of the spinal cord and reach the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus they will synapse on the nucleus gracilis as well as the nucleus cuneatus where in the medulla right they will synapse there in the medulla so this is how the first order neurons has terminated here now what happened the second order neurons start from there right now second order neurons will cross to the opposite side remember it is going to cross to the opposite side it will cross the midline and it, it will ascend upwards as the medial lemniscus see the pink color which you see here right the medial lemniscus right the lemniscal system again that is the bundle of nerve fibers right so this will ascend upward as the medial lemniscus reaching the thalamus remember thalamus is a very important relay sense uh, relay center for all the sensations except the olfaction right other than the olfaction all the other sensations are going through the have a relay in the thalamus right so once they reach the thalamus they will terminate there in the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus now from the thalamus the third order neurons start and they will reach the cortex so this is how the dorsal column pathway the dorsal column sensations are carried right now we have the anterolateral system right so i forgot to tell you the sensory cortex they will reach the sensory cortex that is areas 3 1 and 2 right from the thalamus the third order neurons will reach the sensory cortex right so then another system we we have is the anterolateral system that is we have the anterior spinothalamic tract and the lateral spinothalamic tract the anterior spinothalamic tract is carrying the sensation of crude touch right and the lateral spinothalamic tract carries the sensation of pain and temperature right so let us see how does this work so again the first order neurons the afferent fibers from the receptors right from the receptors the afferent fibers uh, enter the spinal cord and they at the spinal cord here what is the difference from dorsal column they are not going up they synapse there itself right the first order neurons will synapse there itself on the dorsal horn of the spinal cord right and from there the second order neurons cross to the opposite side right they cross to the opposite side and they will then they start moving upwards so the axons of the second order neurons they cross the midline in the same spinal segment and ascend up in the opposite side right to reach the thalamus so this is the first order neuron this is the second order neuron right so the fibers that are carrying the sensation of crude touch are placed anteriorly and these are called as the anterior spinothalamic tract while the fibers that carry the sensation of pain and temperature are placed laterally right and these are called as the lateral spinothalamic tract so the sensations will be carried like this to the thalamus and from the thalamus they will relay up to the cortex right so this is the section of the spinal cord again you can see 
this is the ascending fibers the dorsal column pathway see you can see the sacral and the lumbar fibers i have told you the lower extremity the fibers that is the fasciculus gracilis from the lower body as well as the legs you have the fasciculus gracilis that is medially that is arranged like the sacral lumbar thoracic and cervical right so the thoracic and cervical that is the upper body as well as the arm right so that is uh, the fasciculus cuneatus that is arranged more laterally in the dorsal column of the spinal cord now the lateral spinothalamic tract that is arranged laterally that is carrying the pain and the temperature and the anterior spinothalamic tract that is carrying the crude touch as well as the pressure also right also the pressure is also being carried by the anterior spinothalamic tract right so so with this we come to the end of our first video i hope you have this uh, the concepts have been made lit a little more clear please do give your comments in the comment box below so we will continue in the next video thank you